Hey guys, happy holidays and happy new year. Welcome to the last episode of the Launchpad Podcast. For this year. <laughs> for right? this year. Yeah. <laughs> you got me nervous for a second. I was like, uh, is this a bit? <laughs> Surprise, Rumi. I got you a present. <laughs> it's lots of free time. <laughs> <That'd> be- <laughs> that would be hardcore to just like tell me during an episode. <laughs> <laughs> for this awesome. year for this year this is the last episode of 2021 um dude i don't know where the time went it was 2019 i was i didn't have a baby everybody was running around free and clear and then suddenly a pandemic hit and now they're like hey guess what you lost a, like a year and then when you came back like another year just flew past i don't know like people said like you have a kid and time's gonna start flying what the fuck happened to 2021 where did it go (laughs) yeah i felt especially the last like two or three months it was going fast and it was like whoa whoa slow down thanks like like, first it was like slow slow we'll slow down halloween then it was like slow down thanksgiving and then all of a sudden it's fucking christmas next week oh yeah it is it is ridiculous um i'm i'm excited though you know a lot of things are happening a lot of stuff's going down I'm I'm excited to see what 2022 brings, but just Jesus Christ, it went too fast. Uh, but we're going to talk about we're going to talk about a little, little year in review, a little wrap up. We'll probably get sidetracked for most of that, but but we have some plans. Okay, <laughs> we got some yeah. plans. So follow us on social media: Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Launchpad Pod, and our website launchpadpod.com. Check us out on YouTube. Wow, you guys uh, really rolled out the red carpet for Matt's dad. Making yeah, one, that was one crazy, of our most right? listened to episodes of the year. Thank you, and Matt's dad thanks you too. He's not on social media, so he couldn't get. <laughs> no, <all> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he barely uses a computer, so you couldn't even like email him. <laughs> <laughs> you can send the mail to this PO box. <laughs> <laughs> he gets a letter. I liked you on that podcast. I am thinking of you post haze. Please write soon. No, he wants a telegram where it's like, Dear Mr. Corrigan, stop. You did good on the on the Launchpad podcast. Stop. One of those old timey phones rings. Ring, ring, ring. He has to hold up and talk. Yeah, he cranks it. <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah. Oh, you liked me on the Launchpad podcast? Affirmative. Ahoy, hoy, click. <laughs> yeah, then he's like, I have to go do some errands now. And he gets on his bike that has a giant wheel in the front and a small one in the back. <laughs> Little dog chasing after him. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, let's get on with the show. Ignition sequence start. Six, five. All right, welcome to Launchpad Podcast. I'm Aaron. I'm uh, Matt. Matt, it's not the last one ever, but it's the last one of the year. It's been a good year, dude. We had some fun. Oh, for sure. We did. I think we did a really good balance this year of like some really fun and interesting and cool interviews, especially during the pandemic, but also some really fun, just, you know, me and you back to basics, just trying to crack each other up, trying to trip each other up and have fun with whatever topic we're talking about. I think I think we really did. We had some great guests. We had some very interesting, like comic book creators um, from areas of comic books that we don't normally talk about. Uh, the letterer Janice Chang comes to mind. That was really fun. That was a lot. Um, yeah, she was very interesting, and I learned a lot about lettering. And then, uh, of course, Sandy King Carpenter, um, which was an amazing interview. Sandy King was mm-hmm. amazing, and uh, we love talking to her about Godzilla a little bit. You know, she had that Rodan statue in the background. Yeah, but. I have to admit, one of my favorite parts of that interview is John Carpenter in the back, like making a sandwich, making a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear him just beep, 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 like working on the microwave, boop, bing, you know, hot. And the best was if you guys watch that YouTube, you can see the point where Aaron and I both realize that that's happening 
and then immediately started texting each other slash uh, uh, Zoom messaging about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, oh my God, are we going to accidentally get John Carpenter with a hot pocket in this episode? Yeah, just walking by, blowing on his hot pocket. <laughs> <laughs> I, and then like he, at one point he gets like an Amazon package. He's like, whoa, what is this damn thing? <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Sandy! <laughs> yeah. That was good. Um, I also like for me a huge one was when we had uh, Gary Girani on yeah! for you know he was one he was oh, the creator attack, and the head dude. of Dinosaurs Attacks as well as a bunch of other shit. But like that's one of those like I don't want to say it was a childhood dream to talk to him, but he made it a very crucial and part of my childhood a reality. Yeah. So it was cool to talk to him about that. Here's some of the stories behind those cards. Uh, if you haven't checked these interviews out, guys, definitely worth going to check out. Um, we mentioned the wonderful Sean Corrigan, my dad. We did an episode of what movies would be improved if we were the protagonists instead of the actor that portrayed them, be they action stars or what. But uh, that was a fun conversation. He fit in really well. And I think he, Aaron, told me that he had such a good time watching you and I pull out dates and facts and things about movies and just crack each other up. He's like, I couldn't keep up with you guys. I was like, you did actually, you did a much better job than you think. But he's like, but you guys are just on it with the wealth of shit that you know. I was like, yeah, but that's because I don't know where fucking any of the states are or I don't know about U.S. history. But I could tell you like about the rise and fall of the Galactic Empire, <laughs> how the hyperdrive of a T-16 works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like, holy shit, man. D-16 but, actually doesn't have a hyperdrive. <laughs> God, I was going to say something, but I was just going to let it ride. I didn't want to call you out on the podcast. So if we've retained any of Matt's family, um, I apologize for insinuating that I would have an incestu incestuous relationship with Princess Leia if I were Luke Skywalker in the movie. But, I mean, Carrie Fisher was gorgeous. What can I say? <laughs> And and in in Empire, she was as hot as she ever was. I when she's got the braids up over her hair and Echo Base, that's the height of print. And and see, I guess in Bespin with the noose haircut, see, yeah. And everybody goes straight for the metal bikini. Look, nothing wrong with that. But look, I like me a little conservative, all the way buttoned up, you know, because then that leaves a little mystery. I just I don't know. She looks she looks hotter. <laughs> she started to look a little old, and you could see some some. Uh, ragged edges of the drugs and stuff in Return of the Jedi. You don't think so? You don't think she was yub nubbing with some drugs on on uh, this? Oh, I think <laughs> she was Jedi? fully racked on coke, but that's okay. You know? <laughs> you know? It's okay. I like a party girl. <laughs> <laughs> I know, like she was teasing the death sticks. <laughs> <sighs> All right. Let me find. So where's Salacious Chrome? I need another hit. <laughs> oh my god oh, well Matt it's we the get... end of the year so like uh, let's talk about something let's, let's, I want to do this what have we been thankful for this year that's like been like you know media comic books movies whatever it is is there something this year that came into your life that you're thankful for um there's uh let's see I'm working my way through Star Wars Visions which is fine but I'm not really thankful for that. Did you see that? No, I'm, I, I, you know, it's not bad, but it's very, there's like, um, there's nine episodes. I finished eight of them. They're all very, um, even different styles. They're all very much anime, which there's nothing wrong with, but they didn't vary a lot. Like, I don't know. I, I, I mixed feelings. I don't want to ruin it, but it's, did they're worth like, watching. Did you like animatrix? Yes. Loved it. But when you watch, different aspects of it. I feel like they all kind of told different stories related to the universe of the matrix. Yeah. This is all like there's eight episodes. I think three of the episodes are literally the same story just told slightly differently in terms of like, essentially it's like, what if there was one person with a lightsaber, whether they're Jedi Sith or whatever, and they come across another person with a lightsaber and then they fight. And also the lightsabers look very similar. They're all like, th there's three episodes that have a samurai sword lightsaber. And the first time I saw it, I was like, interesting. The second time I was like, that looks like the first one. Then the third time I was like, that looks like the last two. So it's like, it, uh, it's the same shit. The style looks different, but a lot of the styles are very Japanese. Like the first episode is essentially 
Samurai and Star Wars combined. And I was yeah. like, interesting. But then so is the third, the fifth, so and the seventh So they needed episode. somebody to help keep the variety. Like when we talk to the uh, Nightmare Theater guys, what, what yes, do you do to keep right. the variety? You already have a werewolf sure, story, so yeah. you got to go with something different. Yeah, and I th- here's another problem. I feel like Star Wars, for whatever reason, is really hampered on its creativity. Because when I've watched any number of Star Wars things, I thought Mandalorian did a great job of being like, let's not do Luke Skywalker the same shit we've seen. Mm-hmm. Like, for, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the iron grip that the mouse has on the story or the property or the IP or, wh- or what the situation might be, but I feel like Star Wars easily gets stale with like, well, we have a lightsaber. Well, look, we, we, we got to see it with those red fighter guys in the second Star Wars like sequel that was like where they killed Snoke and those mm-hmm. guys had that whip chain. I want to yeah. see a, a lightsaber whip. I want to see a lightsaber shield. Like, I want to see a lightsaber battle axe. And people are like, no, you can't do that. Either the fans are too rigid or the structure's too rigid from the mouse, but there's something about Star Wars that's starting to feel rigid to me. And I think I'm excited to see what Boba Fett is. I thought the Mandalorian really did a great job because there were no lightsabers until we got to Ahsoka, and even that felt more fresh than anything else we'd seen in a long time. So Yeah, I you know, agree. I you know what? I, there's, there's so much Star Wars now that I, as a human being, can't care about all of it. Bingo. So, like... This, I'm like, uh, this is all the same shit, but I'm like, you know what? It's 15 more minutes of Star Wars content that I'll watch because I like Star Wars and it's fine and I have no horse in the race. I'll just enjoy it for what it is. So even the three episodes that I was saying are very similar to each other. Okay, one of them really brought nothing to the table, but the other two had some stylistic and some animation points that were pretty cool yeah. and some cool moves. All right, I'll fucking like that. And now that I'm done with it, I don't need to buy the action figures. I don't need to buy the DVD. I don't need to rewatch or anything. But like, I enjoyed it for the half hour I watched it. End of story. The fandom doesn't bleed for me on that stuff. Like when I was a kid, Star Wars, anything Star Wars, I bought. I didn't mm-hmm. care if I wanted it or not. I want. I it. Need, yep. I needed to be a good fan. I don't feel like I need to do that anymore. I like Star Wars just enough to not like. I'll probably watch Visions. I'm actually really excited to see what they do with that kind of stuff. And you know, again. And the most creative things we've been getting lately are the Lego Star Wars knockoff things. Yes. But they get away with it because they're parody. And right. I want to get into this. And we'll get into it. Did in you minute. watch the Halloween one? Yes. It was great. It's fucking fantastic with the Lost Boys. It's a little too ch- kiddy, but their callbacks and the, the Christmas one, the stuff that they tie into, I'm like, this is brilliant. It's a mm-hmm. little to aim for children but again what am i expecting from a lego oh you didn't you didn't appeal to a 37 year old man but still they had like some really pretty deep cuts from the lost boys as well as you know the normal shining and stuff they had some pretty good you know homages and parodies and jokes about things that you and i care about that there's no way a kid would know you know i and i think the halloween uh, the halloween one did way better than the christmas one for that aspect I, I think they're so creative, but again, they get away with being more edgy because it's a parody, and, and sure. I really do want to get about this in a, in a minute. Um, I am thankful for DVD re-release companies like Vinegar Syndrome and Arrow. Mm-hmm. Thank you for taking a large chunk of my fucking money this year. <laughs> I have Raw Force and Flesh for Frankenstein coming today in the mail, and I am so excited. Uh, you ever seen Raw Force, Rumi? No, but it's actually on either Prime or Tubi, and I keep looking at it, and it's like, oof, I just had time to sit down and watch that. Yeah. Is it a good one? Oh, my God. I watched like 10 minutes and was like bought immediately. It is <laughs> terrible. I love Miami Connection. If you guys haven't seen Miami Connection, it's sure, one of my yeah. all-time favorite B-movies, because Miami Connection has a lot of heart, and it's like actually a really good, feel-good movie, but cheesy and bad and so fucking funny. But Raw Force is the Burbank like Karate Club goes to this island and gets attacked by like ninja cannibals and zombies and stuff. And it is just schlocky, cheesy, sleazy, and so much fun. And it is so bad. And I, it's one of those like so bad I had to buy it. And I, very rarely, mm. like I watch plenty of so bad I like it movies, but not enough to buy it. To buy a bad, yeah, like, yeah. not enough to buy it, not enough to spend this much money on it either. Like, you know, people were like, you spent what on what? Like, I had one of my favorite movies that you actually bought me uh, a couple Christmases ago is uh, Deadly Spawn. Yeah, yeah. 
great movie, but not a good movie. And if you told somebody I spent eighty dollars on this DVD, this Blu-ray, people would be like, <laughs> "The fuck is wrong with you?" Right. And you're like, "No, no, because it's hard to find, and I need it. I need this. Why, why, why wouldn't I have this?" I feel that Do way you about find Rock Wars. this is here. Here's a good um, divergence. Do you find that a lot of your friends who are like us and have similar interests and shit? are stopping collecting physical media to the point where they're like, you're, you bought that on DVD? And I'm like, yeah, I bought that on... Why wouldn't I buy that on DVD? No, if anything, they're ramping up. But they're not buying really? new things. Like, nobody's buying Star Wars DVDs. Yeah, new movies, Nobody, right. Nobody's right. buying the Marvel things on DVD. Right. You know, that, it, that you're like you said, it's Vinegar yeah. Syndrome, it's Arrow, it's that kind of shit. Yeah, Shout Factory and Scream Factory. Yeah. People but I have spending, friends who even like yeah. that, like friends like you, that you and I would be like, did you get the new such and such? I'm asking them. They're like, no, why would I buy it? It's on Prime. And you're like, because it's a fucking uncut version that has 36 seconds left. And they're like, no, I don't need it. And you're like. Yeah. What? No. Well, the one that really tempt is tempting me is the Arrow box set of um, American Werewolf in London. And it is a gorgeous box set. And it's a huge, like, it's got all these discs, all these special features and posters and shit. And I'm like, ah. But again, like, I love American Werewolf in London. Do I need a box? I already have four copies of that movie through different iterations. And one of them is Arrow. Yeah. How many different versions of RoboCop do I own? How many more do I need? Because at the end of the day... I don't care about special features. If I have a disc and the special features are there, but I will not buy something for the special features, and I know oh, you do. Oh, see, I will, depending yeah. on the movie. There are certain movies that would change that. The Blob on Blu-ray, if they had, you know, the special features. The new on there, one. Yeah. The new one, yeah. That that made me buy that movie again, and I have sure. it, I now have it three times. I have the, the DVD, the Blu-ray, and then the special features. And the nice Blu-ray. Blu yeah. Um, I have bought at least two full sets of every Friday the 13th movie. <laughs> yeah, I have a friend that's getting into horror movies and she was like can I borrow some I was like yeah and I'm just giving her DVDs and I'm like I already have two other copies of this so you don't have to give it back like you, you could just keep this I will buy so many copies of Godzilla movies by the time I have the collection that I want sure it. because right. like right now like Biolante is this golden jewel that you can't right. find and it's impossible um, so I have a bootleg of it, but when they release that like hot sick edition, I'll buy it immediately. Right. And then they're going to release like the, he see Col criterion right. collection and I'll buy it again. Like anybody who has control of the Miramax like library, I think they can currently have control of Biolante. Like guys, I will buy that movie like seven times. And I know, <laughs> yeah. like, come on, like, <laughs> let's get this thing out here and criterion hook it up. What's going on? Uh, there's been some good like movies this year, though, man. I am I am super thankful for a movie called Mitchell's versus the Machines. Yeah, you, I remember you told me about that. That's a chill, like a, a CGI a family, children's yeah. animated family. Movie. I'd say it's family. It's not okay. just for kids. I mean, there are some yeah. good good adult ones in there, but that movie is pure joy. It's by some of the same people who did uh, Enter the Spider Verse, and uh, man, I love that movie so much. If you guys have not watched Mitchell's versus the Machines, get on it. Just let me think. Movies that um. Well, one thing that I watched just now that you confirmed was this year was Invincible on Amazon yes, Prime. Yes, brother. And I've been wanting to talk about this. That was fucking... Like, I knew what it was about. I knew the gist of it. But once I started watching, it was fantastic. If you guys haven't watched it, it's on Amazon. It's a Robert Kirkman <laughs> You're even later made. to the party than Matt is. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> right, if you haven't seen it. But, you know, it's it's not for kids. It's a mature animated thing. But the first episode... There's a couple bad words, but I noticed nobody dies. You don't like, and definitely a couple things explode and people run away. So I was like, oh, okay, is this not going to be like a bloody free for all? And the whole show, the whole first episode happens. There is some amazing character development between the main young protagonist who is like a teenager who's just getting his superpowers because his dad is essentially Superman, you know, from another planet and everything. And the dad is like teaching him how to use his powers and stuff in the first episode. And there's some really good character development. They explain flying. Like he says, flying is like flexing a muscle, which no shit is something that I wondered about for Superman. I was like, why don't, and I don't read a lot of Superman. Maybe they did explain this, but I wish Superman would explain that it's like flexing a muscle or holding your breath. I can't do it indefinitely. I, you know, that's why I don't fly everywhere. Cause I'm always like, why would Superman walk anywhere? Right. 
because it's like flexing a muscle. I can only do it for so long, so hard. Yeah. But like in it, the dad's like explaining when we fly, we create our own leverage so we can punch as we're flying, which makes sense, right? Because if you're flying, how do you get leverage? He make, creates, I get it, it's so cool. Then at the end of that episode, the credits roll for a couple seconds and it cuts to their version of the Justice League. Yeah. And this guy, Omni-Man, who is uh, amazingly voiced by J. Jonah Jameson. What's yeah. his name? Whiplash guy, mean drummer, M- mean drum teacher. Um, <laughs> yeah, now I don't have it pulled up. He's fucking, um, and fuck, we should know his name. You pull it up while I talk. He just comes in and kills, just annihilates J.K. Simmons. J.K. Yeah, we should have known that. He voices this character so amazingly, and he just shows up at the JLA's, you know, lair and just murders them in the bloodiest, most brutal. Like there were two or three murders that I was like, oh, like yeah. I viscerally was like, oh, and he, their Dude, blood, the, their version, eyeballs. Yeah, their version of the Flash comes up and starts speed punching him till yep. his hands break and they're just bones flopping against his chest. It's what. Re- Dick, and it's the whole show had not been like that to no. that point. So it made it extra. Is, the first episode is basically clean. It's like, you know, they yeah. punch some dudes and like some, you know, you see a couple bodies fly. It's around. almost family friendly, right? It's, it's pretty. Yeah. It's PG-13. It's, it's, yeah. It's not and bad. After the credits roll, they're like, welcome to the hard R. And you're like, and it's brutal to the point. Like there's a Batman character that tries to get away and he grabs him by the foot and just slams him into the ground and his head essentially explodes. And then he whips him back and forth two or three more times and then throws him at another character. It's brutal. And I was like, oh, shit. I now don't know what to expect from this. This show had multiple instances of the most brutal thing I've ever seen on television, animated or not. Yeah, I think that's pretty... That's that's probably pretty accurate, huh? I had never seen anything like this massacre. On TV, ever, and I, I probably wouldn't have worked in in um, practical, like in 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 live action. Right? I don't think you could show this level. So I love it. You know, it's kind of this coming age of age story where this kid like finally gets his superpowers and he's trying to learn how to use them. And his dad is basically Superman. He's trying to figure it out. And we know after the first episode that his dad has slaughtered their version of the Justice League. And in, in the second episode. Um, his dad's still kind of under because his dad passes out after getting, you know, it's a fight like his dad also, even though yeah. he kills everybody, gets his ass beat by the Justice League, but he kills everybody and passes out. And they're still trying. Nobody knows what has happened at this point um, in the second episode. They're like, well, you have to help fill in the gaps like we have basically the Teen Titans, but you need to fill in the gaps here while your dad is passed out. And he's like, all right, I'm up to it. Um, and these like time traveling guys show up, the Flaxons. And that's when shit got real. You see like a grandma get blown to pieces and he's like holding her intestines at one point and like trying to save people. And he realizes that like the slightest mistake can lead to real people's deaths all over the place. And I just, I just love how they expand on these ideas of superhero, superhero teams, superhero factions, but it's all structured in a way that you recognize. And this is something I really want to touch on. We can talk about it after we go through this, but this show is essentially a parody of superhero comics. Mm-hmm. But it takes itself completely seriously. But that's why it's allowed to have a Batman character. That's why it's allowed to have a Hulk character. But they're taking their own spin on it, but because they're kind of tongue-in-cheeking it a little bit, they get away with basically just saying, yeah, we know we're not doing anything new. This is the Justice League. These are the Teen Titans. This is Superman. This is Batman. But they get to do it in a way. Same thing with The Boys. The Boys is basically a parody of everything we've created or, or you know, comics have created and then saying, oh, like, what if we shit in its face? And they're like, okay. And then what if we punch that pile of shit? And they're like, oh, okay. And The Boys just went hard on that. Like, they have all the archetypes. There's a Superman character. There's a Wonder Woman character. There's a Batman character. There's an Aquaman character that they constantly make fun of. Like, it's parody. Same thing with Rick and Morty. It's parody of sci-fi and science fiction and all this stuff, but at the same time, it takes itself seriously enough that it gets away with making fun of the Borg and doing hive mind jokes and time travel and actually does a better job than if you were trying to do that in a create a new thing. Mm. Yeah, I think that I guess that's true. And I think 
I mean, literally, if you if you are parodying something, you have a lot more wiggle room legally as well, right? But I guess as an audience member, if you're watching a parody, you give something a little bit more slack, like you give it more rope to hang itself with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is I've 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 read something like this before that Mark Ra- Mark Wade wrote called uh, uh, Irredeemable. Yes. Which is really good as a premise. But then I read like, I don't know, 30 or 40 issues of it. And it doesn't I don't remember if I finished it or not, but it just doesn't go anywhere. There's no resolution that makes me be like, oh, OK, good. Like essentially Superman character gets embarrassed by the Lois Lane character kind of slamming the door on him when she realizes it's him. And he that that helps him crack to just become this power hungry Lord who just destroys the earth, essentially. Um, and it's brutal. Which is interesting, I, I, and I hadn't seen something before that. I hate I hate when characters are. Um, I'm a bad guy because of lover's scorn. I think that's such sure. a, such a shitty reason to be bad. Like in real life, like in real life, when we hear about like some guy goes on a murder rampage, and it's like because his girlfriend was mean to him. Get the fuck over yourself. Like she's allowed <laughs> yeah. not to like you, and like people are allowed to say like. That is like to me. That is the worst excuse ever. People who are just like, "Oh my, my pride in my heart." Like, go, fucking, just jump off a bridge and leave everybody else alone. At the very least, um, um, literal, literal, literary, literally, in literature, yeah, it's not original. You know what I mean? And like, it's one thing to think that a Superman type person would react like any of us might but like it is very easy door to walk through for that but also you're superman go to anyone you want and be like sup superman and yeah like, well oh, but he man, loved man. her but uh, like that being said it just wasn't like for me it didn't pack the punch of a story no so invincible did well and so in invincible the the show and now this is based on a robert kirkman comic that i had not read until after i saw the show in the show we see the murder at the end of that first episode. And then we know that he did it, but we don't know why. He also is acting cagey throughout the season and other characters start, like his wife and his son start to notice it, which leads us to believe that he hasn't always been like that. Yeah. There's One of a my really favorite cool characters yeah. in that is Damien Darkblood. Yeah, I knew I was just about to say the same he's thing. He's a Hellboy, he's a Hellboy parody. He's this demon from hell who's now He's like a Constantine a, parody. Yeah. Right? Well, Cuz he's like he's a Constantine and Hellboy mixed he's together. He's a demon detective that is trying to win his way back out of hell and redeem his soul by helping others. And he's essentially like Rorschach, Hellboy, and Constantine merged into one. Yes. And he knows something is fishy. So he's searching. He eventually, because of him searching, the wife starts to kind of notice that something's up and that some shit isn't adding up with the story and everything. But I thought he's a great character. There's also a um, a government agent named, I forget what his name is, but his uh, Cecil, I think. Cecil. His his. He's voiced by greatly voiced by Walter Goggins. He doesn't know what's going on either, but he has his suspicions. He eventually banishes Damien Darkseid, which I still don't understand why he did that. Because Because Damien Darkseid is poking around in the wrong areas because something about like what's happening with the Global Defense Agency, the GDA. Like if Damien Darkseid pokes around outside of the GGA, it also points fingers at the that the GDA to like, hey, okay, you guys, sure, sure. You guys could have stopped this and you were aware of it. And Cecil even admits later, he's like, Yeah, we knew the possibility was there and I had always been worried about that. But I can't pull the triggers on these things until something actually happens. Mm-hmm. Something actually happened. But he didn't want Damien Darkseid to be poking around because I thought he, he's a great but I mean Cecil was a great character. He the, was really cool. The voice acting in all of this is amazing and like you have a, a who's who. Like Steven Yeun plays Mark Grayson in Amazingly. He amazing. does a fantastic Sandra job. Sandra O oh is his mother Debbie Grayson. JK Simmons as Omni Man. Um you have uh uh Jillian Jacobs is Adam Eve from mm-hmm. the you know she she's been in Doctor Who and all this other stuff. Um, Walter Goggins, uh, Zachary Quinto, 
Jason. Oh, Zachary, Zachary Quinto does a good job. He plays robot. Yeah. Who's, I, I don't know, essentially almost like a vision. He's a robot character. That's like ultimate logistical planning. He's the leader of the teen Titans group that then eventually becomes the, the new um, justice league to fill in as they create the new justice league. But He's also doing some secret bad guy shit, which is awesome. Right. right. Um, we have, uh, Jason Manzukis is one of the guys and I cannot not hear him and his character from, uh, big mouth at the same time. Like mm. just saying nasty shit. He's a filthy, filthy character. Um, Mark Hamill as the tailor who creates superhero suits. suits. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have Kari Payton from uh, walking dead, uh, voicing, uh, there's a Mark bunch Grinchel. of walking dead people. There's in this a show. bunch of walking dead people. In it. John but Hamm, you have, I mean like yeah, Seth Rogen does it like there's so, Lauren Cohan from walking dead. There are so many, so many Lenny James, and the, so many the show does a good job of setting up some characters and some plot lines that hopefully will be picked up in later seasons. Yeah. And then, you know, the whole time you start to learn, you don't really learn anything about Omni-Man's murder shit until... Um, Episode 7. Yeah, he... One of, the, one of the murdered guys, who's essentially a Superman-esque character, comes back from the dead, <laughs> excuse me, and just starts wailing on Omni-Man in front of Invincible, his son, and uh, Omni-Man just murders him. And he says something like, you should have stayed dead and just rips him in half. Rips him in half. But this episode has the most brutal thing I have ever seen in my life in any form of media. Ever. Any form of media ever. I've read comic books that have slaughtered thousands of people. <laughs> this has topped, tops the cake. Is this the train? We're talking about the train, dude. This is episode seven, not episode, episode eight. Uh, is it seven or eight? I don't remember. But I okay. think it's in seven where the train happens. But it. Well, is, what happens is so he, uh, Omni Man, murders this this again for the second time. Murders this hero the in immortal, front of yeah. Invincible, and he's covered in blood. And he looks at him and he's like, "We need to talk." And then he tells him this story. And the story is essentially, you know, at the beginning of this, it was very much the same story as Superman. He says, I'm, a, I'm from Vitrium um, and uh, I'm this alien and our, our civilization advanced so much that we wanted to, you know, share it with the universe. And I was picked to come out to Earth and I've been here trying to help. And eventually everyone else is going to come. But, you know, I'm here to be an emissary and try to keep Earth safe. That's the story he's told everybody. Yeah. It's episode eight, by the way. You were right. So I, I figured I, from episode two, I was like, okay, why did he murder everybody? And I was like, what would be a good idea? And I thought from episode two, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if his planet was not out to help everybody, if they were here to conquer and it turns 100%, out yeah, no, that is what it was. Right. That, so they, they the, you were supposed to think that from episode two on, you have six episodes to be like, when are they going to drop this bomb? Yeah, when, like, what's going to happen? We've here? read enough comics to know exactly how that works. Like, if he's a bad guy, this is the reason why. Like, he's right. here to he's here to farm Earth into something else. So he, yeah, he explains, and I'll get into the comic in a second because that has something to do with this. But he, the Omni Man explains to Invincible most of what I told you is true, but we were not this like beneficial race. We were this warrior race who just killed our half of our planet. So that only the strongest half survived. Then we just started to create this empire across the galaxy. And essentially he was sent to earth to monitor it and to get it ready for conquering, which in the mo in the show wasn't explained as good in the comic It's explained a little bit better, but it does to me. It, well, so he says that, and he says, now that you have your powers, you got to join me and we're going to take over the earth. We age slower as we get older. So we'll be alive for literally centuries. We can All rule this planet for dead. centuries. Yeah. And then, you know, the rest of our boys will come and we'll take over this planet. And Mark Invincible doesn't obviously is like, what are you talking about? You have mom, you have me. And he's like, your mom is little more than a pet to me. I don't really care about your mom. Yeah. And the mom is listening in and she's, oh, that was a fucking heart wrenching scene in the comic. That doesn't happen. She doesn't yeah. watch or listen to it happen. Um, they play a recording for her after the fact, but you watch her break down listening to this. So like all, not only are her suspicions confirmed, you but like, oh. lead though, but he says no. And his dad's like, well, I'm going to fuck you up then. 
and starts Which, beating the shit out of him. Like hardcore. Not, not just punches, like punching him through a mountain, punching him through national monuments. He punched like, him through like one punch through a city, and we watch Invincible smash through a bunch of buildings that then crumble. He smashes and rolls down a street, knocking cars and shit over. Yeah. And he comes over, the uh, Omni Man comes over and is like, one punch from us can kill thousands. Yeah. He's like, and he like that. He's trying to convince Invincible to his side. And he literally is like, just to prove my point, I punched you once. And by punching you, I killed thousands of people. Yeah. That's fucking ridiculous. And he punches him down underground into a subway. And he's like, they, they mean nothing. Humans are nothing to us. We are gods. We are superhuman. They are nothing to us. And to prove his point, he grabs his son by the head and holds him out in front of him to the oncoming train. And the train plows into them. And body after body after body just splatters across Invincible. Because neither one of them moves. Invincible and Omni Man stay where they are. The train just drives through them. And he just takes... And you see it. You see like an over-the-shoulder shot of oh, Mark, right? Just corpse after corpse, eyeballs, blood, teeth. Hand, it's hardcore. Body parts. And it goes on for like 10 seconds. Yeah. It, seconds. It, it goes on way too long. An entire train full of people, hundreds of people splattered against their bodies and just destroyed. And it is like the most hardcore thing I've ever seen in my life. Amazing. Like, I, I, there was nobody to high five when I saw that happen. I was like, Rufio, boom. It's unreal. And it does not, that does not happen in the, at least where I am. I pretty much read to the end of this story arc in the comic. Yeah. And more or less, and I'll explain that in a second, but more or less, and that didn't happen. Um, but the gist of it did. They, oh, the, the subway collapses on them, but he doesn't hold him out in that defiant, like, well, watch this as you watch these people smash into you and die. Um, the fight just continues like across the country, across the globe, into the mountains. And Omni Man is just destroying him. And he's like, if you're not going to, he's like, I can't allow you to get in my way. He's like, I'm going to live here for centuries. He's like, 17 years. I've been here for 17 years. That's nothing in the course of my life. I'll just, I'll kill you. I can always make another son. And you're like, oh my God, that's fucking hard. Like, and this is where it just like, irredeemable but not as hard this is where it starts to lose me we'll finish up what happens he he says where in 500 years everyone you know will be dead yeah. who you know who will be who will you be with who will you have and he said i'll have you dad and omni man goes to punch him can't do it and just like blasts off in his face yeah so there's a couple other things that the series ties up loose end wise but here's the thing that i don't understand if you come down and you're omnipotent and your job is to prepare this planet for takeover, I guess he falls in love and loves this woman, but it's not clearly, it's not like the greatest love ever. It's more like a hobby. And he says in the comp, now I read the comic because I thought the show was so good. I thought the comic would elaborate on a lot of the stuff. No, it the show does. Better than Did the you comic read the comic? Book. Yes. The show, yeah. is better the show, than the I think it is. The, there's the only conversation that is more elaborate in the comic, and it's only by one or two sentences, is when he explains what his actual role was from Vitrium, that he was supposed to be here. He was supposed to make sure that nothing on Earth got strong enough to you know, stop the onslaught that was eventually coming. And he also explains that he, he liked living here. He loved living here so much that he kind of questioned if he really needed to be doing his job and that... He started to be a superhero as like almost like a cover about that way he doesn't have to hide, hide, but he liked it. He liked helping. He liked that role. He became friends with all these Justice League people. And then it says, and when you got your powers, I knew I had to make my decision and finally get back on track, which I guess makes sense. But it, I, I wish they explained that a little bit more. It just feels like they just rushed through both in the show and in the comic that they rush through that. But I like in the show that there is that moment when he gets his powers, he's like sad and he's not sad because now his son has a hard life ahead of him of a sure. superhero. He's sad because now his mission has been triggered. Like right. now he has to do 
that shit. Which doesn't make total sense because what's what's the ticking clock now that Mark has powers? That who, Mark who gives might a turn shit about sense, him? man? Why do we give a shit about sense? There's <laughs> flying dudes and kaiju's. Who well, because to me, it feels like, like in I that- hate I hate when people try to l- add logic to superhero bullshit. Like, well, what's his motivate? What's Omni Man's motivation? He let's say he comes to Earth. He now like enjoys it here enough that he puts his mission on a back burner because he doesn't. He doesn't really have to do it for the. We only have eight years. episodes to tell the story. <laughs> Fucking period. Like, it, like logic doesn't matter. Does the story get where it needs to go? Great. If there's a part I don't like, that's fine because life is so illogical. There's so many things that we're like, well, why did they do that? And when you can see eight episodes and like poke holes in it, fine, that works. But like. You know, there's so many times where, like, we're at work and people are like, this doesn't make sense. And they're holding up the shoot. And it's like, it doesn't fucking matter. Because when they edit it into 16 episodes, it'll be fine. Well, I just, I understand there's a lot of things in this that I don't, like, I feel like they're glossing over. Yes, but sure. to have this guy and, and just take that one fight, he now, like, he, and he says they were my friends, yeah. but he murdered them so hard. Why did it like why then did it have to happen then? And why like then Mark says no and he immediately is like, okay, I will beat the ever loving shit out of you. And like to prove a point, like you you have to know, right? If you're you have to know that if your son, if your son's your son's gut reaction is to say, I'll stop you. You can't do this. Yeah, he your raised gut his reaction yeah. is to just destroy a thousand lives to prove your point in that moment. It's not like you talked about it and debated about it for a week or two and then said, okay, I'm just going to show you. I'll flex now to show you. For me, it's like when I was 16 and my dad told me this is how it's going to be, my first instinct was, well, fuck you. Yeah. And I mean, I guess maybe that's what this is. Maybe this is well written for a teenage dad relationship. But like for Omni Man to be like, hey, I want you on my side. If you don't say yes right now, I'm just going to kill everybody that I see today. And it's like, why would you think that that would get him on your side? That doesn't logistically make any sense. It, but here's the thing he's raising his kid wrong. He raised his kid to be a hero when he could have raised his kid to be morally gray. Where it's like, think about all the people today who are raising piece of shit kids. And to them, everything that's happening in the world like makes sense to them as that. Sure. And that like, do you think Nazis raise their kid to be Nazis? Yes. So <laughs> it was easy for them to suddenly be doing that shit. Like sure. you don't raise a kid to be evil. You raise them to be good kids, but you instilled them with the values to do what you want to do. And if he raised his kid to be a total hero, then he did it wrong. Also, why weren't you the leader of the of the Justice League team? Because he was like this outsider. He didn't want to right. be a part of it. He didn't, he didn't want, want to be on the team. Because I think I could control shit more and be like, oh, we should wait five extra minutes before we go do that. And like, I think you could be a little more integral in in the the strings that you're pulling if you're sure. to be taking this shit over. Well, but, I want to say that he knew he could fine. take them down anytime he wanted. So he was like, there's no reason to do that sort of, you know, espionage aspect of it. And he didn't want to get too close to them emotionally. But that's a small thing. But anyway, I mean, I I, I just have it, it, it makes for great cinema, right? Or great storytelling to do that train scene and to have him punch him through a building and to almost kill him on that mountain. But then blast off when theoretically the sun grasps that last piece of humanity. humanity. But that's a lot of penduluming in a one, you know, in literally one sequence of a show, you know, to be like, I hate humanity. I'll kill you. OK, I guess I won't kill you. I'll fly off into space for, you know, I guess we don't know why just yet. Till season um, two. Something I want to bring up, though, is, is that and, and this is again, bring it back to the Nazis. Why not? <laughs> um, I read this very fascinating article that said that. You know, the, the horrible genocide wasn't their end game. That was a side effect of what they were doing. That was just like something they were doing on the side as part of the plan. They were trying to make this awesome country by building roads and fixing the economy. They were trying to do good for themselves by getting and, and getting rid of all the people they didn't want involved in that was a side effect. So like when you say like Omni Man was feeling good about helping people. Yeah. Building great roads and making a nice city does make you feel good all that genocide on the side is just a side effect when you don't see them as people and that's so fucked up 
because now that's you know the, the genocide is the thing that we focus on and we should because it's horrible and we should never let it happen again but like when you see somebody who is a genocider when you see a character who's a villain their inhumanity is just that is a passe side effect of their feeling what they're trying to do their mission is is always bigger than that which is it's just wild and and to see it played out in real time of him just like these people are ants to us is just insane and it, i i'm very interested to see where it goes the comic so the comic didn't really elaborate on much and the show definitely has storylines and threads that were not at all in the comic so i'm or at least up to where i've read so i wonder if they borrowed from other pieces like the whole robot subplot in yeah. the show at least when omni man goes into space in the comic that's not mentioned at all that so, hasn't happened at all I'm a, there's a I'm couple into, other things cecil was yeah. only in two or three scenes in the comic and yeah. he's a pretty prominent character in the show and and i'm glad he's in the show more so i i have the first omnibus like the first big book that is basically yeah same with me arc. and i have um i read part of the second one and you know the second one slowed down quite a bit and in it, it does include parts from there to here and i think the 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 show streamlined they're like hey here's the comic book we did a great job with the comic book. comic book's awesome but how do we streamline this sure all that stuff with battle cat and like what's his name was it war cat i don't know the, the big lion guy who kicks invincible's ass at one point oh in the show yeah 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 that wasn't in the That's comic at huge, least where i've read uh it's a huge part of the like it's a big fight in the comic yeah, right that whole here. subplot yeah. with that concrete guy who kind of takes over. Yeah. That hasn't happened in the comic. Yeah, so that that comes up and it's cool. It's cool, but this did such a better job of like streamlining that story arc. Mm. And I don't know um I don't know if the Mars thing happens in the, did that happen in the comic book? No. And that like there's a lot uh, the murder doesn't happen until like issue 3 or issue 4. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that happen first before the murder. Um the the time traveling aliens or the aliens from the other dimension that come and then end up aging mm -hmm. that's a much bigger deal in the show than it is in the comic the comic it's it's like three pages and yeah. then omni man flies into the portal and you don't see him fuck them up in the show you see him destroy this civilization it's awesome. because we're supposed it's to awesome. like we see it but the rest of humans and earth don't see it we see it in the comic you don't even see any of that i, I think the show's better in the comics one of those instances it has been so far i mean I for me so far although yeah. I, it's that paradox of i wish i'd read the comic first and then saw the show and would i still feel that way no. you know what i mean like well, spawn was the same way i watched the spawn cartoon first then read the comic and was like the comic is good but it's not as good as the as the cartoon the cartoon was awful what are you talking about? It the was, HBO Spawn cartoon? Yeah, it was done so shittily. What are you talking about? It was so slow. It didn't even follow the comic books. Do you know that you're in the minority in that and that a lot of people like that cartoon? A lot of people are wrong. <laughs> I, I would love to dissect that. I love sure, that. You can like the cartoon all you want. Hey, you know what? I'm glad we had a cartoon, but it was done crappily. It was done worse than anime. Like an anime is known for cheap mm. production value. And Spawn the Cartoon Show was done worse than that. I would love to talk about that. I think it like, has its... His like, what you're animation saying, was so repetitive. It was just... Yes. Like, uh, what you're saying uh, is not necessarily uh, untrue. And you're right. It is very slow. There's a lot of stories and so storylines that don't go anywhere. You have fucking Spawn. And you spend so much time with him brooding and talking. It, it's That's like, what the comic was that, too. It just didn't have... I don't think but, the comic but, had as much but action. But I can go, yeah, brood, 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 just flip page. Oh, he's killing. He's punching through people. Green <laughs> energy shooting big guns out of nowhere. Bugs Bunny style. Like... The, the cartoon didn't get into any of that, and I've, uh, I felt ripped off. And it, Oh, like, man, I'd love to talk about that. that I'm would so be... glad we had an adult version of Spawn, but you could do it better, so bring it back and do it better. Well, I, I this, wouldn't disagree with that. Like, like the, the, it's, the, it's the first step, but man, you know, I would stay up late to try and watch that and be bored and be like, oh, well. well see, I think bed. I saw it, and I was like, wait, because my, my aunt got it for my cousin, who was like 10. And she was like, I did not realize what this was. She's like, you can have it. And I was like, oh, Spawn, I under like I had not read it, but I knew what it was. Yeah. And I put it in and I was like, 
he just said motherfucker in a in a cartoon. And I don't know if I'd ever seen anything before that. But but again, like you you already had Aeon Flux, you already had the Max, and those were doing adult cartoons better already. Yeah, I think I I can understand that. Uh, so, but it, uh, well, we'll talk about that. That would be a fun one to talk. You probably love the movie, huh? That's your movie? spawn. You love no, the movie. The movie sucks. <laughs> The movie looked Stupid. cool. They did a good job with the look, uh, and and John Leguizamo as mm. as, as clown. Wow. Ah, yeah, it looked great pretty job, good. dude. Great job, dude. And I, yeah. I and I thought it looked good for what it is. It's very dated, but that movie got completely lost in like uh, CGI shit and like yeah. not again. You didn't focus on what the actual story from the comic book was. You made up your own bullshit, and then you didn't pull off a good movie. He also so, didn't show Spawn. Like, Spawn was digging graves, and Spawn was walking around without a mask, and Spawn didn't have a cape the entire movie. He had a cape for two shots. Two shots. Well, the get cape the is expensive. So, oh, I get it, but don't make fucking Spawn movie if you can't make you can't one make of the, the most iconic things. Can you imagine if you made Batman, but you couldn't put, like, the bat helmet on? Yeah. Like, you, all you could do is a rounded helmet? What the fuck with that? Like, I, I mean, yeah, no, the, the, so the movie looked good, and I loved the toys that came out of the movie. I had all those toys, man. Oh, I had all the Spawn toys, but me and my brother love Spawn. Uh, but, but yeah, I was always, uh, the comic books were great, man. Comic books were great, and they were so good. Nobody's done it right yet, so Spawn, here we go. Why do we Bring talk in 2022. about this? Where do we talk? Oh, the book and the, co- the books and the books Invincible, the, the comic. Very we rarely, like the show better. Yeah, very rarely does the show do better than the comic book, and I think yeah, I would agree. One of those. And 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 like I have some literary examples too. I think I think The Shining, arguably, I'm mm-hmm. sure many people disagree, but I argue that the movie's better than the book. Jaws for sure. Jaws is the one my dad yep. used to say growing up. He'd always be like, anytime he said the book was better, he'd always be like, the book was better. The only book that wasn't better than the movie was Jaws, and he's fucking he's right. Sorry, Peter. Um, yeah, and um, uh, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Interesting. But, I don't remember if I read that. Here's what I will say. The movie and the book are completely different. And sure. If you made the movie of the book, it would be this bizarre fucking Jacob's Ladder thing because the book is from the point of the view of the silent guy that they call Chief. He's, mm-hmm. he's a Native American and he's silent most of the movie. In the book, it's So it's just per- page after page of blank pages? Blank pages. No, no, no. It's his perspective, but periodically through the book, it's like, and then the room fills with smoke and the walls open up and robots come out and start fucking with our brains. And like, I kid you not, it has like robots and like, my, like it's weird hallucinations because mm-hmm. he's crazy. Yeah. The movie is from the point of view of Jack Nicholson and right. they like completely, and that's fine. And that made a fantastic Oscar winning movie. If you had made the book, I don't know if it would have been the same movie at all. It's like the it's like The Shining, and and I guess to a yeah. lesser but still, a other extent, Jaws. Like those books and movies are not necessarily hand in hand. But I will say, if you read The Shining, you watch the movie, and you read the book, you get a different experience, but you get the same experience. You read Jaws, and you read the you watch the movie, and you watch you watch the movie, you're like, hey, this is a cool shark movie. You read the book, and you're like, oh, the Jaws is a metaphor for his penis, <laughs> and it's a bunch of like adultery and shit um but you read one flew over the cuckoo's and you watch the movie and you go whoa it's the same thing from a different perspective mm-hmm. fucking cool right 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 but yeah no I, I think invincible was incredible i highly recommend it. if you haven't watched it then you're as late as matt to the party you well i thought because we've seen this before right we've seen the adult okay. superhero yeah. story that's <laughs> like what if the main character was not the shining example of what we think it's supposed to be mm-hmm. we've seen this a lot so i was in no rush and I think the cartoon is definitely better t- better storytelling than what I've seen this story before. Um, so it's it's worth checking out. <laughs> yeah, if you're fucking more behind than I am, check it out. We got we got a Christmas break coming up. Check this out. But this is what I was talking about. Media is folding in on itself because we have so many things that are basically just parodies of our existing structures. And it's like I can tell the same story, but here's how I make it different. But if you had gone through the trouble to make an, um, a new story that isn't based off of the structures that we already know of superheroes and superhero media, then you're, you have a huge uphill battle to climb. Like mm-hmm. When you create a new superhero and people are like, oh, you're just ripping off Batman, that's very difficult to make successful. But if you're like, hey, guys, I'm going to rip off Batman. It's going to be fun, right? Wink. And then you actually show something really cool about it. Oh, oh, that's interesting. But it, I feel like we're in a time where you can't do something original without relying on the ladder work for something else. Mm. Or just fold it over. 
Yeah, that's interesting. Because it's like, I would love to see more horror stuff. I would love to see a horror version of this where we parody all this stuff. And like Leslie Vern- Vernon is one of the closest things we've had. But that movie, again, is a great slasher movie, but also is just calling out all the other slasher movies that we've already right, seen and right. being like, hey, remember that stuff? It's your favorite thing, Matt, when a movie goes, hey, remember that thing? You but that it, was doing you? it, I thought, in a really tasteful, fun way. It wasn't just like, I think there's a difference between calling back to something or just sh- giving me that thing and presenting it as your own. Like, I think Family Guy does that. Family Guy's like, remember Transformers? And you're like, yeah, but that's not a joke. Like, you rec- you recalling Transformers to me is not a joke. Whereas, like, Leslie Vernon was like, you know, in Jason, when Jason always walks, this is what's really happening. And you're like, okay, you're taking that. You're bringing me back to that reference, but you're telling me something else. You're giving me something with it instead of just being like, remember? Remember that? But doesn't In- Invincible do that? Hey, you guys know the Justice League, right? No, because it's like, it's like, thing. what if, what if Superman just murdered the Justice League? And then Amanda Waller didn't know who it was, and she was working with Superman to figure that out. Yeah. And then what if Lois Lane was then like, wait a minute, he's acting weird. You know what I mean? I feel it's like it's there's more layers to it. Whereas you know what I, I mean? I feel like Marvel isn't there. I mean, they obviously are doing the what if, but I like that this is new characters. I like that this is not. You could easily do this story and be like, what if it was Superman killing these guys, and like, what if? You know, mm. Superboy had to deal with like you could easily transpose this into the characters that we already know, and I feel like that's what Marvel does. They're like, we will not let go of the properties, and like we're going to tell these stories using the players that we have. Whereas I feel like Invincible basically told a great DC storyline using, but like it isn't stuck to DC. It also has Damian Darkblood, who's you know a Hellboy uh, Constantine character. It's awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, awesome. No, I mean. It's good, and I'm very interested to see what the rest of the show looks like. Like you said, I have that compendium, which I think I'm only like 500 out of a thousand pages in, so I I have a lot more to go. So I can yeah yeah, yeah. I can no, keep and reading. you're gonna get to the the tiger battle cat guy. He shows he's in the first book. Oh, cool. Um, but it's very interesting. Man, yeah, I'm excited. Season two, I think, comes out in 2023 though. So hmm, right around when my proton pack shows up. <laughs> <laughs> well. Um, you have I, other stuff to wrap up. I have one yeah. cool thing to wrap up the year. I got, uh, I, I, if you guys haven't seen Ghostbusters, man, I like that movie. I haven't movie. yet. Damn, dude, you gotta see it. So is I it, can, can I it. see it at home or is that like you need to see it in the movie theater? You never need to see anything in a movie theater, period. See, this is why we're not the same person. Yeah. Yeah. The movie theater is a overpriced, annoying experience with people. Oh, watch. Things. We've had this discussion. No, I yeah. love the movie theater. I, I miss it. I like a big screen. I sure. hate other human beings. You don't like sticky me. floors? I don't like sticky floors. I don't really like popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree with you on that. Okay. I no don't popcorn. like other human beings in the room with me being like, <laughs> text, text, text. I agree with that. Getting up every five minutes. Like, ugh, when I went and saw Ghostbusters, people kept getting up every 10 minutes and walking out. And I was like, lock the doors. Don't let those people back Didn't out. Didn't you want like, to be like, where are you going? Entire, fa- entire families got up, walked out. And then came back and sat yeah, down. Yeah, And then like or the food whole breaks. time. But, but all at once? Like, where are you going? Get snacks, come in. Like, sit down. Stop. What, what, there's a movie on. I paid money to see it. Stop <laughs> fucking around. Everybody, if you're not watching this episode, you need to check out the YouTube link because watch how like Ruby was talking about everything else and then watch how his entire face changes when this topic came up. Because so he got mad. He's serious. Up, now he's back to Jolly Ruby. Look, I fucking loved Ghostbusters. Um, but you can watch it at home. You yeah, can watch it right. at home. It's so fine. It's it's good at home. It's a good movie. Um, and I it's a great sequel. It's a great sequel to the first Ghostbusters. Even the first two, but it doesn't acknowledge the second one. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. We we get it. We get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So all right, guys. Uh where wait, 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 Well, I got I got a, something to bridge us into twenty twenty two. Oh, you do? Yeah. So the other day I checked in with a acquaintance, Jeffrey Brown, who is the writer artist that does Vader and Son and all the Vader and Son books. Um, oh, those fun like children's books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I think Rumi, you know this. I don't know if everybody else knows this, but 
I have a piece from him that I did for a tr- like this amazing trade with him. I had this memory of when I was a kid, I was in the bathtub and I told my dad that the water was too hot and he touched it and he said, no, it's not. It's lukewarm. And I was like probably three, maybe four years old. And he said, it's lukewarm. And I thought he was patronizing me and saying it's lukewarm because he knew I like Star Wars. So I was like, no, it's not. It's Darth Vader hot. And I was mad at him. And I said that to him. And it's one of my earliest memories. So when I read Vader and Son, I thought that would be such a cool thing in that one panel style. So I reached out to Jeffrey Brown. I was like, listen, would you, you know, would you be up for, for this? And I was working with uh, some so a special effects shop that did some Star Trek stuff from the new movies. And I was like, I can trade you some Star Trek props. Or he's like, yeah, let's do Star Trek props. He's like, I'm really busy right now, though. So it probably won't be for another year or two. So I thought he was blowing me off. And less than a year later, he wrote me back with this beautiful fucking piece, like maybe six inches by six inches. And it's Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker from Vader and Son at a bath. And Vader says, it's lukewarm. I have felt it. And Luke Skywalker says, no, it's not. It's Darth Vader hot. But it's like a fully rendered piece. It's beautifully colored. It's one of the most vivid, bright pieces I have. And I, the reason I asked him for that was to put it in Kent's room. So before Kent was even born, I framed it beautifully and put it in Kent's room. So I have this piece. So every once in a while, he and I will check in with each other. And uh, I'm always like, hey, if you ever do another book, please, you're welcome to use that. Put it in a book. It's going to be, or it is in a 2022 calendar. There's a Vader and Son calendar that's coming out that I wrote him the other day. And he's like, oh, yeah, I've been meaning to write you. I'll send you some copies. He signed and sketched on the on the calendars. He sent me a couple. But in August, fucking me and my dad's memory of me taking a bath is now a Vader and Son cartoon in a fucking officially licensed Lucasfilm calendar. How cool is that? That's fucking cool <laughs> isn't that neat that's fucking cool i'm like so fucking excited my dad didn't really care uh, amanda doesn't really care i'm like are you serious why did your dad not care it didn't well he him. cared but he was like he cared but like it's like oh cool i was like i'll send you one he's like uh, i'm just gonna put it on the shelf he's like don't send me one of the signed ones keep it i was like well i have a couple he's like ma i was like dad this is goes how cool we're a fish, like cool. you look on the back of the calendar and it shows all the different pictures so, like, our picture is there with the Lucasfilm logo. Like, that's fucking awesome, right? And you have it on your wall. The original. And, like, yeah. And that's that's actually happening a lot more where people are commissioning things and then they end up becoming, like, I know Frank Miller does that all the time, where, like, some guy will buy a commission, whether it's a spec commission or he'll ask him for a commission of this, and then eventually they'll just use that as a cover to Batman or something. So, like, that shit happens. Um I want this to be in a book so bad, but on the calendar is pretty fucking cool. It's amazing. So yeah. Vader, Vader and Son 2022 calendar, you could see Darth Vader and Luke standing by the bathtub. That's actually me and my dad. And then Luke drinks the pee-pee water. <laughs> no, never. <laughs> no, actually, in my house, Leia used to poop in the, in the tub and I used to freak out, ah! jump up against the side of the wall, screaming till my dad came and got me. Uh, as you should. That's gross. <laughs> I agree. Why they kept putting us in the bath together, I have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's how I'm going to start my 2022. And actually, Kent is really into X-Wings. So I just went on eBay and I bought him a Power of the Force 1995, still mint in box, X-Wing, and a couple figures to go with it. And I think he's going to lose his fucking mind. Mm. Yeah, I have a bunch of Star Wars to go through. I'm excited. Um, I, I bought one of those Hasbro um, Hasbro Pulse. Oh, did you? Proton the Mandalorian packs? ones? No, the Proton Packs. Oh, oh, oh. I'm oh, switching. Pulse. Yeah, oh, the just, Hasbro yeah. Pulse. Yeah. Not the Pulse Rifle. I got it. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I thought about it, but like... I got I'm, the Aliens Pulse Rifle, but okay. So I, do, when does that come in? 2023. I got a whole year to wait on it, but... You know what? I've gone this long without a proton pack. I was going to say, what if your house gets infested by ghosts? At this point, I'll be all right. Um, I bought a uh, Jason Voorhees mask slash bust from part seven with his all goofy teeth. You know, the Jaeger. Oh, nice. Teeth. Uh, no, uh, it's uh, Buchler teeth, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Did the makeup. Buechler, Be- Beekler. Beekler was seven. Beekler with his goofy teeth, um, a part seven. So I got that. I got to get the hockey mask for it, but it's just his head and it's going to be cool. Is it a bust or is it a mask? It's a mask, but it'll, I'm going to use it as a bust. As a bust? Yeah. I just got the uh, Ultimate Collector Set um, AT-AT Lego. It's like friggin', it's an $800 show, set. That's it's cool, gigantic. Dude. A buddy of mine already started putting it together. I got to wait for my Lego aunt to come help me with this, but I, I don't know fucking where I'm going to put it, but it looks radical. You're going to put it up and then uh, smash it. Put it down. <laughs> Ken's going to fucking knock it right over. Yeah, I can't build a, a block tower three blocks high before Sammy's like, meh. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, well, this has been good, guys. Follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Launchpad Pod. The website, launchpadpod.com. Check us out on YouTube. Let us know what what is your stuff from 2021 that you are happy about. Was there any media, comic books, books, movies that you watched that you loved that you were like, yes, I know a lot of people watch that Squid Game. I still got to catch up. I got to Oh, yeah, I didn't watch the Dude, my kids in kindergarten know the Japanese song in that movie or in that show. Like, a lot of them. Like, kids dressed you- up like that for for Halloween. <laughs> Weird, right? Like, I was a horror kid, but not in kindergarten. Yeah, I wasn't allowed to watch Squid game stuff. My mom was like, what's Squid Game? And I was like, it's this. And she was like, for real? And I was like, no, 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 it's a drama. They don't actually <laughs> die for money. <laughs> oh, man. It's going to be a wild year, man. My job's going to end. Got to find the next thing. But I got You moved back to L.A. No, I'm not moving back to LA. No, just think sorry, about it, bro. I'll think, think about, about it. it. I'll come back for a month, maybe. I'll take it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm staying here. Kids in school. Mm. Who knows? We're trying to find. We're trying to find the next gig. Hey, if any of you are big post producers, hook me up. <laughs> <laughs> I will work on any horror, sci-fi, comic book property you want. All right, Rumi, let's blast this thing off. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> That's it. Farewell, 2021. We're the Rocketeers, and we are out. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff.